Nationals who are doing masters in marketing subjects or MBAs, those sort of subjects. So um, it's quite specific in terms of the skills that they want to learn in quite a short space of time. So they're asking for, um, sub well, I, I gave them supplementary videos. And I, I looked into the, res the research into this, and uh, uh, a maximum of about 10 minutes is as long as anybody can stand for a video. I thought about recording the whole lecture itself, which would be about 40 minutes of me speaking and the rest of the two hours of the students doing exercises. But what I did is just recorded a 10 minute uh, summary of what I did. Um, so this is, what it can, this is what it looks like. I think there's a picture of the, uh, of the webcam there. So you're trying to imagine looking at this webcam and picturing what it is that your student actually wants to get from this, uh, this mini lecture that you're giving. It doesn't really help with your creativity because you're just seeing like a little robot. So I'm trying to imagine what is it that the students actually want to get out of this presentation, this mini lecture that I'm giving to them. So I want to identify what the best practices are for um, providing these lectures, these uh, videos for the students. Uh, to identify possible insights for future improvements into the way that, uh, that I and other students create these supplementary videos. The, the first videos that I created were for, for Language Box as part of the Fable project. And this is an example of one of the videos that was on the Language Box um, website. And it was a feedback video for a student who'd written an essay. And um, it was advice for another teacher who might be giving feedback on how to give feedback to a student's essay. I was reasonably pleased with that, but I wasn't completely satisfied with the video itself. But I wanted to make improvements. I wanted to find out how to improve on these videos and make them better. Um, one bit of feedback that I've got for that specific video, which I was very pleased with and uh, a little bit embarrassed, is that Dr. Newman has said it's exactly what I would have liked when I was preparing my own PhD. Um, this is very good feedback, and so I would recommend this to friends and colleagues who are currently teaching or studying. So, uh, some very good responses there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that, if that is probably too much praise for it. I don't think it's really worth that. Uh, effective video design, this is Professor Bonk who's uh, quite into the, the MOOCs and uh, the way that he, I, I really like the way that he does videos and I think that um, Siri and Donnelly had it, uh, uh, they, they had a really good take on, on the way to create videos and they said that a casual approach should be, should be taken with videos and we tend to make things too academic but if you follow a casual approach students are more likely to watch those videos and it reduces the cognitive load on them. Uh, that means you keep it simple for them. Keep it casual, keep it simple. Uh, Professor Bong is very good at keeping it casual, making it quite fun. Uh, don't assume too much technical knowledge. Um, and the, the advice there would be because you're excluding those students who might have less technical um, ability. And we'll, we'll see whether that's true or not. Um, so I decided to keep it casual. In fact, in some of the lectures that I gave, I would use very, very simple uh, concepts in order to express that are quite complicated uh, subjects. In fact, I used uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears um, to explain how to choose a, a, a how to give a, a research proposal. That is, you get something that's not too big, not too small, not too hot, not too cold, 
um, that it should be just right for this researcher at this time. So keeping it casual to a simple um, model to express a complex topic and that's the, the kind of recommendation that I give for creating these videos that it should be simple and casual even if you're explaining something which is quite complex. Um, and the reason for this is, well also uh, as we're, we're all getting older, um, our students are you know, still staying the same age and they're um, what we might be calling uh, digital natives and they're growing up using technology like the child in this photograph here who's uh, drawing a picture using an iPad. Certainly not something I did when I was a kid, I used, I used crayons. So obviously they're, they're learning how to use the new technologies in ways that we perhaps we haven't. Um, and so we can learn a lot from them um, in ways that they can't learn from us, but we, we can learn from them in the way that they use the new technology. So um, what works best for them? Um, the benefits for using recorded uh, video found that uh, it increases the motivation, enhances the comprehension, and the teacher effectiveness is what Holzblatt and 2011 said. And um, also, there's an opportunity to enhance your kind of emotional aspect of the video. You can actually make a connection with the teacher in a way that text doesn't make a connection. So if you're giving your students a, a PowerPoint presentation or extra text to read, you're not making that connection with them at a later date. And what I found is uh, I'm able, with a video, to connect with a student in a way that uh, you're not able to with text. Also, <coughs> Troy and Yang said that it's an opportunity to demonstrate empathy and understanding with the students at a later date, asynchronously, um, and you can show that the, the teacher themselves is a, a real person, you can demonstrate to them um, that, that you are believable. Another picture of Professor Bonkier is quite good at being, uh, being a believable, um, informal, casual kind of uh, person. So it has a significant positive effect on student learning according to Fraunhofer et al. 2009. Um, it means that uh, students have the opportunity to repeat the lecture and so that they can further absorb the content that you've given. Um, and also this can help students to prepare for the lecture. So if one benefit of it is you can give a, a student perhaps a video that you recorded for a course earlier and they can that can prepare them then for a lecture that they might see later. So, already part of that technical work has been done uh, before and I think there was a research project by Siri and Donnelly about uh, I think it was engineering or some kind of science or technology class where you can prepare students with preparatory videos so they're ready before the lecture and they already have some of the content so that's some of the benefits this is uh, one video which I took from the Favour project um, and I put it onto YouTube and uh, what, as you can see, this is a critical evaluation essay. So a student gave me a critical evaluation essay. I then recorded the feedback that, that was identical to the feedback I gave in the tutorial. <coughs> and this was then put on YouTube. And I've had this on here for just under a year. And in just under a year, I got 9,939 hits on that one page and, and 29 likes. So it's not exactly scientific, but it is quite a lot. And I thought I'd compare it with some of the promotional videos that you get from the university. So, um, I'll go to the promotional videos first. <laughs> this is the sorted by the most viewed for us in business school. And you can see the most viewed, which is about writing a research proposal. So, I, I wrote one about, I, I gave one about doing a research proposal. Um, but this is about critical evaluation essay. You see that the most viewed video is 3,450, which is quite a lot. Um, but mine was 9,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I win. <laughs> Just, you know, it's quite good. And one student came to me and wrote me an email and said, can you help me write my essay? Because I've seen your video and I think that you can help me. And this was a native speaker. And if you look at the number of people who watch the videos, the majority of people who watch these videos are actually UK based. So these are people who live in the UK who have searched for Aston University and they've seen this and they've commented on the video. Uh, so these are native speakers. Well actually I don't know if these are native speakers or not. But the people the people who are doing it were native speakers. Um, so some you know some good comments saying excellent. Um, the, the problem I have with some of these comments is you just don't know who they are and I can't um, I can't prove that these are not me. So they could they could be me. <laughs> um, one student said uh, or one 
commenter said, this is really good, can you do a video on engineering? <laughs> yeah, they're a bit crazy. Um, okay, and also I thought I'd Google it to see where it was. Um, and Google put me on number four. So if you, if you write critical evaluation into Google, then I get number four. In fact, I tried it yesterday and I'm on number three. So it, it's quite, that's quite good. I don't know if that's the same in different countries, but and I tried it on my computer and I thought maybe it's just me. And then I try on a friend's computer as well in Southampton and it actually comes up number three. Yeah. So, it's, it, so it's worth the effort. I think that's the point. It is worth the effort. From a promotional perspective, the fact that you, know, you can talk about, yes, it's effective for me as a teacher and also for the university as well. Because the beginning of the, uh, I really shouldn't have done this, but the beginning of the, um, the video I said, oh, Richard Gletley from Aston University. And perhaps I should have said something else. I just said, Richard Gletley, freelance. Or something. Um, okay, so this is how uh, this is how students accessed the, uh, the page through the foot, the um, the VLE, which is Blackboard. Um, it's quite simple. They've got an option to either download the PowerPoint presentations or the document, which is the literature review that I wrote, um, or they can click on the video itself so they can watch it. It's linked to YouTube from within Blackboard, uh, and they can watch it that way. Also, there's a link to the questionnaire. Just look on the top right there, there's a link to the questionnaire, because I wanted to get their feedback on it. And uh, I did bully them a bit to get them to fill in these surveys, because uh, they're a bit lazy. I mean, students and everybody is a bit lazy about filling in um, surveys. So I did try to persuade them to complete it. What time do I finish? Um, I think we're fast. 25 past. Okay, so I, so I wanted to encourage them to use it, so every week I would say, how have you filled in the questionnaire, how have you filled in the questionnaire, so I had 40 students, and I think um, out, of, out of my group, um, over 50% of my students did complete the questionnaire, mainly because I kept reminding them about it to, to keep filling it in, so it's quite a, quite a high, uh, high completion rate. And um, this, is, this is important because I'm doing statistical analysis. So to, get, to do a statistical correlation analysis, we need to have a, a high response rate to make it valid. So um, it's quite a high response rate. That's the, uh, that's the video which was um, Stomach Shepherd in the Academic Writing. So it links from the Blackboard page and straight onto that page. The software that I'm using now, I'm using QuickTime on an Apple Mac. Um, I'd recommend using that because when you're recording videos, you, you don't want at any point for your computer to crash or for there to be any technical issues. Um, Apple Map is very, very simple. QuickTime is very simple. There's, there's no complications. So um, everything worked perfectly using QuickTime. So this is a, a standard, kind of, this is my, my average kind of student. Generally, female, majority of them of Asian origin, um, ages between 21 and 31. Um, and the response rate was 25% for the whole group, but this was for the whole cohort. Um, 40 of them were in my class, so if you count the ones that I, that I bullied, it was over 50%. This is the uh, survey that I created, and I did that using Google Docs. You can create a, a survey, Google Forms, rather. you can create a survey. It's very easy and uh, effective to create a Google Forms. So they can do um, respondents expected the video to help. Um, they were more likely to state that the videos would help them later in the course than that they say that it helps them right now. Um, they, did, they were very positive that the videos would help them at this moment in terms of completing the writing assignments they're doing, but they were more positive about them complete, helping them to complete a uh, writing assignment they would do later. Although I haven't surveyed them to find out um, exactly who it helped and who it didn't, so I can't say, I can't say for sure whether the, these videos actually really improved their grade or not. And I think a, a colleague of mine had tested whether videos have improved their performance or not, but it's only, only minimal really improvement that's been objectively uh, assessed. I, I don't know. I think that's worthwhile following up. So I've got a picture here of a student using a laptop, and this is because I found that specifically those students who have laptops were more likely to say that they found these videos useful than those who had any other kind of technical device. So those who said they had an app on their phone, or they had a PC, or they didn't have one, 
they were less likely to say the videos would be useful. So those who have laptops are more likely to use the videos and more likely to expect that the videos will be more useful for them. So there's something about those who are more, uh, more likely to be using technologies. I don't know if that helps. It's like if you've got students who are in the class and they all have laptops and they're probably more likely to be enthusiastic about using videos. Also, uh, parents' education <coughs> is um, advice of uh, Panos Lakopoulos, who's the, the CLIP um, <coughs> leader of the PG Cert program, um, suggested that I look into the social demographics of the students um, to find out whether those students whose parents went to university were more or less likely to find these videos useful than those whose parents did not go to university. Um, and I think that the students whose, whose parents were more educated were less likely to find these videos useful. Um, the, the, and I, I guess, I mean, hypothesizing it, it may be because they have, more, they have more understanding for higher education, so they're more likely to, to read a, a research paper or to read a book themselves rather than use YouTube and to use YouTube to get the information. Or perhaps they find the information too simple for them. I do try and make it simple, and perhaps they find it too simple. Perhaps they're looking for something more academic. So perhaps the videos are less useful for those of a more educated background. Um, also they found that the videos, that the language of the videos was easier to follow than those who, whose parents were less well educated. Uh, so perhaps their English was better. Um, so perhaps the, the videos are helping those people whose English is not as good as, and those whose English is better perhaps would find that too easy. But then you have to keep a, a balance, you, know, you have to hit, you have to target somewhere in the middle, you can't keep everybody happy. And there's always someone in the audience in the, in the class who's, who's bored because it's too easy, and there's always a few people who are bored because it's too complicated because they don't understand it. Um, okay, contrary to Heemske et al. 2009, who suggested that uh, female students found technology, were, were less confident with technology, I found that female students were more confident with technology, than the male students. I don't know if that's something that's happened since 2009 or if it's just my students. Mm -hmm. um, all the students also uh, were more likely to prefer more complexity of information in the video than the younger students um, who, who, who perhaps preferred it uh, more simply. Um, is it too simple or is it too confusing? <coughs> So um, I asked students, did they think that it should be about just talking, or should it just be, or is it too simple? Um, and those those who preferred it to be just just talking, because I included quite a lot of links within my videos, so I have talking and then uh, web links and uh, all sorts of different websites that are used. And perhaps those who said that they would prefer me just to talk to keep it simple, uh, so that they, they didn't enjoy, they didn't like. Um, seeing all, the, all the, the, the extra things that I was doing with multimedia within those videos. Uh, so perhaps there's an, there's an asynchronous learning aspect to this where you're, you're having students who will um, listen to what you provide as, uh, in terms of YouTube video later, they're more likely to, to say that they find it, will find it useful later. Um, but there, there is a downside to that because uh, personally, as a, as a, as a teacher, you, you, you're teaching, let's say I'm teaching in September, October, and the students are expecting to use it in March. So they, they say that they will find it very useful in March, but I'm teaching in September. Now, thinking selfishly, I would say, well, actually, I, I should be paid to teach in March as well, not just September. And what I'm doing is I'm providing something for them to get for free in March, but they don't have to then have it again um, in March. So there's a, there's a downside to that. Going back to the original question, is it, is it worth it that I have to ask? Well, if I'm providing something which is really effective, I'm not really just replacing myself. Um, and that could be a bit of a problem if it's too good. So uh, mm. don't make it too good. Now, there's a, another problem with putting it on YouTube as well. If I'm putting things on YouTube which are really excellent, um, if you, perhaps people say that they won't need uh, tutorials or teaching at all, then I just follow them for YouTube videos. I don't know if that's true. Um, so it's necessary to design uh, students to the videos with uh, understanding for their affinity for technology. Uh, they should be designed to be casual and engaging. 
So it's not to be too uh, not to be too complex because this might exclude some students if it's too complex. But then also if it's not complex enough, you might exclude um, other students for those more mature students. Um, okay. It's limited because I can't uh, then measure the objective effects of those videos. So there was no assignment, so there's no assessment at the end of this course. So I can't say for those who had the supplementary videos, um, I can't say that they performed better than those who didn't because there was no assessment. I would expect there to be a minimal um, effect um, on their performance, but until I research that, I can't tell whether there's a measurable effect on the difference between a, a performance on assessments or not. There's something to, to do to think about. So, to, to conclude then, is it worth the effort? And I think that overall I would say yes. Uh, firstly, there's promotional benefits for the teacher. Uh, so for myself and, and for you as well, you can create these uh, YouTube videos and perhaps uh, raise your profile as a teacher. That is if the videos are good. Um, secondly, the student feedback was overwhelmingly positive, um, especially for their expectation that they would use it later. So they're very grateful that I created something that they could use later and go back to. Um, one student fed back, and there was quite a lot of feedback, but I won't give you all of it. Um, they said that this might dissuade lazy students from even coming to class. Um, there's a possibility that you know, students won't bother if they think, I'll just get it in the video later. And I guess it's like us today, because there's a lot of presentations today, we can watch the videos later, so we don't actually physically have to be at all the presentations. Um, so they're increasingly adept at technology and why not use it. Um, changing higher education sector perhaps is a situation in the future where we might be expected to do more of these videos, perhaps not have lectures, but perhaps we provide these, uh, these videos and then we have classes. So we have a video and a class and perhaps that will change things entirely uh, and it, it's probably in our benefits to get practice, to, to get uh, skilled at creating these videos. And, and that's all. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? You play us a bit? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry? Play us a video? Yeah, I could do. <laughs> there was a question. There was a proper question. <laughs> yes, Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, have, you thought, have you thought to make it accessible to a wider uh, population uh, outside the university? Yes, it is, and I think that's a, that's a problematic issue because I've created these five videos that are on YouTube, so anybody in the world can watch these videos. So why is that mm -hmm. problematic? Well, it's good. There's, there's promotional aspects to that, which is good. It's good for the university, it's good for me, and um, perhaps it's good for the wider community who won't practice, so it's, so it's good. Yeah. But there, there might be an aspect, I, I don't know, I haven't asked the university whether they mind the fact that you know, I'm using university branding uh, um, during my, my lecture. And I don't know whether that's a problem for the university or not, I haven't asked. Well, well normally the branding in terms of videos, have you got your logo on videos as well? Yeah. That's, that comes under a different jurisdiction for um, intellectual property rights. Right. So, and I don't see a problem with you putting that out there if you create a comments license. And in YouTube, you can opt for Creative Commons as well, um, as opposed to the standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aston would like it. Well, so the Aston would like it. If yeah. people started incorporating your, your work into their MOOCs, I think uh, they wouldn't complain. I mean, to be a private, like a private uh, tutoring or a private, uh, you see, as, 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 a, as a one to one private teacher, rather than to be a wider. To be up or to so unusual, like for example, that one needs this kind of service. Well, I think that he's from a different country, or he's not. I mean, virtually, we, we, I'm not sure. Is it a good idea? Well, one idea is that a student came to me a few weeks ago and gave me an essay and said, "Would you help me to write this essay, correct this essay?" Because they'd seen my YouTube video, yeah. um, and then I, I suggested to them that they send me a copy of this uh, this essay and I could create a feedback video based on their essay, which I could then publish on YouTube. So it's a, it's a service where you give feedback to students and there's also there's promotional benefits to that too as well. So.
so you're, you're creating feedback um, for, for the wider community. Does that answer your question? Can I ask you how long it takes to create a video? Because I mean, if you're a time consuming to do screen capture of any kind and, and video creation, do you go through a process of editing? Yeah, the first videos that I made took me ages. Um, it took me ages. Um, it was like a, a ten minute video, but it took me uh, hours, about two hours, maybe three hours, I think, for this ten minutes. And it looks, but like, I look at it now and I think it's terrible. But that's the one that's really the most popular, and I can't understand why. It's terrible. But the, the later ones that I did, uh, they only take me about 20 minutes or so for a ten minute video. So I'm kind of getting ready for it. I've already taught, taught that. Uh, that presentation, I've got an idea about what 10 minutes is like. The, as I said, the software is much easier if you use the Mac and QuickTime. There's, there's no messing about. You, know, you just press a button and record and talk, and it's very, very simple. And if you do keep it casual, uh, keep it simple, and don't try to complexify things too much, which is what students appreciate, um, that there's no reason why it should take too long. Um, and there are, like uh, Professor Bonk is an example of someone who can make it look very casual and haphazard and like, almost like it's like watching a children's TV program. Um, but that, uh, uh, that's what students like. Yes? Um, we talked a little bit about um, text and we about the, the time it takes to put things together and how you develop your repertoire and you become a lot quicker. Um, have you tried exploring um, the new Mozilla popcorn for your making feature? So I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but you can create a video and pop it into this um, open source software with um, Mozilla, and you can add hotspots. So if you're talking about a particular resource, you can add that as a link to the video it dynamically links to some other resource. Um, so it could be a Google map, it could be a reference in research. I'm actually trying to do that myself at the moment with some training videos that I'm developing around my own software. And I know this is an issue with cognitive load, but as I'm saying it, plus there's the visual that people can choose to click onto or not, I feel that that's maybe a reinforcing um, aspect rather than a cognitive overload aspect. Well, I think that's a good yeah. idea. I mean, you can do things like that on YouTube as well. You can put links into the YouTube video, which I prefer because it's, it's more shareable. Yeah. Um, but it's the, the issue of getting students to actually use what you create and whether it's worth the effort to create that. Because if you look at the, I produced five videos, and I looked at what videos people actually watched, and they watched the first and the second, they said, yes, this is brilliant. And then they didn't watch three, four, and five. So I put a lot of effort into three, four, and five, but not, but uh, they only watched one and two. So if you if you link it to the, the next class, then there's a, there's, there's a worthwhile aspect to creating that the kind of extra links, etc. that you're putting in. So if it's created before the class, then we have to do it before the class. Mm -hmm. You need to have to do it then. Yeah. I think I'm more focused on teachers as well, so then hopefully they're going to be more likely to check out the resources that I've used. Um, and I guess for your 3, 4 and 5 videos, if you build some interactivity into that to make them watch it, that would be another approach to take. There's also the issue of assessment as well, because I'm teaching a course which is not assessed. It's very difficult to engage students in actually taking part. Um, and you know, I mean, feedback for academic writing courses is usually that they say, well, it's a waste of time. Um, they, they perceive it to be a waste of time. I think if you have an assessment in the process, they take it a bit more seriously. Okay, we'll stop there and move on to our next speaker. So, once again, thank you very much.